Hi everyone and welcome to the next episode of Keeping It Real with Aarti and me. Before we start anything, I'd like to say something on behalf of both of us. The topic that we are going to be talking about today is broken heart. And uh, this is something that Aarti and I are dealing with. And this is a journey as many of you will appreciate. It's not an easy journey. And for both of us, it is still an ongoing journey. And that makes it that much uh, it makes us that much more vulnerable when we talk about it and uh, as i said you'll appreciate it's not an easy journey but we still wanted to talk about it because we do believe that this is a journey that everyone goes through in one form or another and talking about it will help other people going through similar painful journeys having said that this is actually a trigger warning so there will be times in the episode when both aarti and i might have to pause to collect our thoughts or our emotions and i'll ask you to bear with us okay so here we go so this episode broken heart now i'll start off with a very very interesting line that i read and it it apparently is scientifically proved did you know that the brain registers extreme psychological pain in the same area that it registers physical pain isn't that amazing which is why when you feel tremendous pain sometimes you just feel it in your heart right and uh, there are so many reasons that you get this tremendous psychological pain that causes a broken heart it could be because of death death of a loved one it could be the death of a family member it could be a death of a pet it could be because of a breakup right it could be a breakup that you didn't want to happen it could be because of legal separation which could be a bitter legal battle and it breaks your heart when things go so negative right and there are so many reasons you, you know losing your childhood home right that could cause heartbreak losing something of tremendous sentimental value that could cause heartbreak so there are so many reasons that causes heartbreak right Ra- arti very much and you know a lot of the things that you mentioned are still out there like for example a legal separation in india unfortunately we criminalize the other person you know it's just that two adults are not getting along but families jump in and then they make it so ugly and all of that but these are still many of the things that you mentioned are still what people can relate to with grief and with broken heart but i want to mention three aspects of grief that people don't really acknowledge sometimes and the first is what i would call complicated grief and it often mimics and is misdiagnosed as depression mm. and you know what happens in complicated grief it's not straightforward like the regular grief process that is documented you will have feelings of feeling very very low there's going to be memories that are going to keep coming up preoccupation with the person that you've lost and you know what happens you're also yearning for the person that you've lost and everything and where this becomes a problem is the person becomes smaller and smaller and then you know they they no longer want to engage with anything in life they no longer interested in things they're unable to sleep because you know these thoughts that are going back and forth in their mind and that's when when it's gone beyond 6 months and all that um prematurely gets diagnosed by a person who's not listening to the whole picture or not looking at the whole picture saying that this is probably depression when it's just complicated grief and complicated grief actually requires very empathetic therapy and that's one area of grief that i'd like to um you know inform people because you know a broken heart nursing a broken heart is sometimes one of the most painful uh things for me complicated grief was misdiagnosed as depression when i was 19 and what did i lose i lost the election in college the senate elections in fact i think when we sat down in wcc one day and we were talking i was telling you about how so many people stood against me people i considered friends stood against me in a strike and i was 19 and i was seeing people playing out their hidden agendas and at 19 i didn't understand the world as well as i do now in you are still not fully yourself to be able to stand against see right now if 200 people stood against me i can stand with the strength of my convictions but at that time you still just building your own convictions you know what was most painful in that complicated grief uh, process anu the people i trusted in my department mm. uh, in my my professors the friends i thought would stand by me were the ones that stabbed me in the back mm. and you know uh 
I struggled for a whole year without friends. For a whole year in the mess and hostel, I sat alone when everybody else had a peer group. And as a teenager, sitting alone is probably one of the most painful things because Christmas celebrations in college, I was alone. You know, and these are big things in college, like in, in adolescence, these are very big things. And that complicated grief, you know, just getting up in the morning used to be so painful. And that's when a therapist that I sought help with said it's depression. But it wasn't. It was much later when I went to Delhi and I started working through, I mm. realized it was complicated grief. The second kind of uh, grief that, you know, is even more complex and the most misunderstood is dis enfranchised grief and you know this is when the grief is for something that's not socially acceptable mm. very painful I'll give you a couple of examples because I'm working with a couple of clients in this area so there is a person who's gay he's not yet come out with his uh, family because you know there are a lot of other issues associated with him coming out though it's legal right now in the country his partner has abandoned him and Oof. he cannot speak about it because you know when your husband or wife leaves you in, a, in an opposite gender, in a heterosexual marriage, you can still go and tell somebody he abandoned me or she abandoned me. But when you've not yet come out, you know, there's so much social stigma associated with being gay and you can't really tell people that, listen, the person left me. And, you know, that suffering that. I'll give you another very, uh, very painful uh, situation where a mother has a miscarriage and she's still mourning that fetus, okay? And, you know, I've known people who've mourned for 40 years with disenfranchised grief. I can give you also people who are HIV positive, um, you know, though there is a lot of awareness now, I know that, you know, there is still a lot of social stigma associated with it being sexually transmitted, people looking at it from the moral lens and mm -hmm. things like that. And also, uh, you know, sometimes chronic illnesses, which, uh, are not obvious like you know if you have like a limp or if you um, have like a physical um, condition that people can understand it's different but it's internal and it's something that you can't tell another person uh, the symptoms are much more intense because it's socially unaccepted uh, uh, and I don't have the social support that I would normally have if I lost a parent or if I uh, lost a job or if I lost an election and that's why this is a much more painful form and you know also an extramarital affair that that goes wrong you know there's nobody to support you because everybody's going to look at you from the moral lens saying what were you thinking i was not thinking i was feeling right i just felt connected to this person i'm not saying that you know there's a right wrong i'm not going into that debate at all the emotions that the person feels in that grief process are very real mm. and the last kind of grief that i would like to mention is the anticipatory grief when you know somebody is terminally ill and you're going to lose them uh, or you know it's a your contract coming to an end your schooling year or your college year coming to an end and you know that you're no longer going to be a student all these yeah. are anticipatory grief and yeah. i'd like us to understand that each one of these can cause a broken heart and each one of these is going to be completely different so no one is going to be able to uh, guide you out of it but your own wisdom and your own courage Absolutely. and that's where i'd like for us to understand why you know like i can give you an example when i lost my dad it's all and today when i was preparing for the session i know i realized it's going to be 10 years and it seems like it's just now you know and when i lost my dad i thought i was ready for losing my mom whenever that would eventually happen. I lost her after eight years. Believe me, it's completely different. Mm, it you is. know, it's, it's nothing, nothing on the earth prepares you for it. And um, I want each one of you to know that you may have experienced many forms of grief and each one is so precious because the love that you've shared is real. The beauty about all of grief is that love was real. You know, um, um, Khalil Gibran talks about how sadness and grief are when there is love in your heart but no person to give it to. Yeah. And that's why it's very important to realize, unlike anger or hatred or any of these other states, grief is something that comes because something that was such a beautiful source of joy for you at some point is now the same thing that turns back and gives you so much grief. 
and let's try and understand it a little more i know i'm not going to be sorry for feeling emotional of tearing up because i want you to realize that it's coming from a space of very deep love and we can all feel this and the more vulnerable we are the more beautiful this process becomes because we start acknowledging that something was beautiful we start understanding that it was beautiful and though it's not there in the form that it was whatever we can make of it now will be beautiful kubler ross elizabeth kubler ross who was one of the first few people who documented the process of grief she did say that there are stages that you'll start with denial then you'll have anger then you'll have bargaining then you'll have depression and then you'll have acceptance and all <laughs> believe me no. it was probably the only theory that existed at some point and then the dual uh, model i mean dual process of mo- uh, grieving model came where you know you'll have the loss orientation and then you'll do the restoration orientation and all that uh, i think they're very beautiful theories when i studied them as a psychologist as a psychology student they were beautiful theories nevertheless and yes there was denial there was anger there was bargaining but believe me it doesn't happen that way because every person grieves differently and it's very difficult for us to you know lay a finger there and say this is how you'll grieve after 6 months you'll feel like this none of that because each person grieves very very differently yeah. and you know the triggers are going to be different you're going to have different experiences around it and you know these things like time will heal and all that i don't really believe the second is that grief is a linear process is the biggest myth i've heard you know where mm-hmm. you'll go through denial you'll go through anger then you'll go through bargaining believe me you will feel okay i'm over this grief right now i'm ready i'm in a good place and all <laughs> like that. hell like and hell then, yeah, and then he'll come and stay you but and he'll like did you really think you were over it and then there will be two days of oh my god i am not over it yes. and that is such a painful painful process because when it hits you it is it's a double whammy because you have just convinced yourself that yes i have now come to terms with the grief and i am capable of you know historically moving forward it comes and hits you with a force that makes you buckle at the knees you just exactly. collapse right yes. and then you realize oh man i thought i thought i was okay i was okay but now i'm not and again i have to go through that grief again right. i have to go through that you know that feeling of not having him there anymore right right and that's where there was a very beautiful theory that i saw as an animation i have not been able to find the source and at any point that i find the source i will share it with people um so it's a beautiful animation so what they say is let's say we draw a circle and inside that circle is all that you consider your life so all your relationships all your work all your achievements all your mistakes everything is inside that and when you lose somebody that you love very deeply that circle and everything inside that whatever you built gets affected by the fact that this person is no longer in your life or this uh, situation or this whatever whatever it is you lose and gives you grief now originally they believed that the circle will become smaller 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 and one point you'll have no grief at all and you'll be over the grief but unfortunately that's not the case the circle remains the same but as you cope as you move you start building a world around that and the circle becomes larger but it's another circle it's not the same circle so when an anniversary comes in your dad's birthday comes in or you know there is a trigger you know you have to meet this person that you were with and you know you bump into them the circle shrinks and you go back to that original point where you know you had to grieve and i thought that was probably the most beautiful explanation of grief and why we will move on in spite of it yeah but we never really completely let go of it and the ones who say they've let go of it are usually people who have either repressed or suppressed it not having you know dealt with it uh, for me what i felt was I think we have to accept grief and loss as part of life. Right? If we do not accept it as part of life and part of the components of life that makes us realize the value of many things in the past and the future, if we don't look at it as that, then it becomes very very hard to kind of, you know, let it in. That's why I think many people just push it out. First we need to understand that our heart is broken. 
right because the understanding that the heart is broken but it's not going to be visible to other people we may be smiling we may be completely strong on the outside and all that but inside we are crumbling and we'll need to understand and acknowledge that this is happening because you know yeah. um, unless we understand and acknowledge moving on or healing that is not going to happen and second is to acknowledge that it's important for us to go through some of these emotions but now maybe you should take over and say you know those things like i'm always there please i think that's very <laughs> yeah. important no f- because for me there was no doubt i was going through grief right because i i knew because i'd lost the man who was most important to me in my whole life so i knew this is this is a very hard journey i'm on and then i'll have people coming and telling me be strong and i'm saying don't tell me to be strong you know because it seems as if you are like not empathizing with my you know where i am and you're like giving me an uh, you know an order instead i would have appreciated if they had said i know you're going through a hard time i wish you strength to get through this you know i would have appreciated those kind of uh, you know um, uh, words of support The second thing is all fate. Okay, I I don't want fate. I don't want a reason. Okay, it's a fact. I am not going to say why because that is not the way I process. There might be other people who for whom it might be comforting to say that, you know, if they had a faith then the god has taken them back and if they had a, a faith in fate then it's fate. Yeah, but I don't question it because I look at death as a fact. So then coming and telling me it's all fate. doesn't comfort me in any way okay. the third thing is which we spoke about don't worry i am there <laughs> i'm not okay. crying for you <laughs> I, i want know. my dad back yes i'm feeling sad that i have lost a relationship then if that is a relationship i wanted then that's what i want i am not looking for a substitute or a stand in so don't say you know that don't worry i am there instead i think it might be nicer if someone says i can only imagine how hard it must be if you want to talk i am there you know i have found i found that during this journey when people said that if you want to talk i am there comforted me so much mm-hmm. whether i take them up on the offer or not it doesn't matter it's but and the last one which i certainly think which i will now hand the ball back to you arti is saying time is the healer time is not the healer because grief will take its time okay it is a harsh teacher which will ignore time it is not a function of time so don't think time is going to heal it's only your intention to heal that is going to make the difference right. and i wanted to add one more part uh, anu that beautiful story of poo and piglet visiting you you remember that one oh, oh that's that a very so cute big. story isn't it yeah. so yeah. basically i'm going to narrate it just for those who haven't heard it so eeyore is depressed perpetually and so he, they have piglet and poo have not heard from eeyore so they decide to go across the forest with their boots and their coats and all that and then when they reach there eeyore is sad and he says please go away because i'm really sad and you know i don't want you to hang around somebody who is very very sad and all that and piglet and poo just decide to sit there and then eeyore asks them why what are you doing here so they say i understand that you're not feeling really up to it but we just want to you to know that we're going to just sit here because that's what friends do and if you can't say the right things like anu yeah. was saying at least just stay silent because yeah. you know sometimes for me what worked whenever i've lost somebody is the silence because i'm somebody who processes it completely internally i don't need to talk about it to you to to process my grief and when people incessantly talk about so how are you feeling right now do you want to talk it's really painful for me to verbalize some of my things and which is why i seek silence and there may be people who want to talk if they want to talk be that person who can listen non judgmentally if you are that person who can be silent stay silent i was going to tell you the exact thing about how a friend of mine during one of my deepest moments of sadness she came and you know my hand is like this she just put her hand here and she would do this that's all she just she didn't say anything she just sat next to me and she and that was so so comforting for me and that's really where i'll move to the second part of the healing process which is acknowledgement and recognition so what you need to know is that you must grieve you know sometimes saying that you know it's over i'm now moving forward forward and all those things prematurely it'll bring you back to same point 
uh, yeah. in, in, in a short while. So you'll need to realize that something happened or did not happen the way you anticipated, expected or would have preferred it to be. And so you'll need to go through it, stay with it. And when you stay with it, there will be emotions of anger. Anger will definitely come because it's a beautiful emotion for change. Uh, to be able to bring about change, anger is very important because you know you will feel angry with yourself for having made some things or not done some things. You will feel angry with the other person for what they've done, what they've not done, for having left. You know so many things. There yeah. will be an element of guilt. You know I could have done this. I should have done this. Uh, those kind of things. And then there will be also bitterness uh, for a lot of us. There will be um, shame. You know, in some relationships, there will be a lot of shame. There will be definitely elements of uh, remorse. There will be um, resentment. So many of these. And it's very important to sit with each of these emotions because each emotion is coming to tell us how to move ahead. And if I'm going to say, no, I'm always positive, you know, that toxic positivity, you know, I'm always positive, I will be completely positive through this, you know, I will think positively, do affirmations. During grief, none of those things work, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. very important not to take life coaching advice just like that from the internet and try and use it in the grieving process. And then you'll move to compassion, resilience, empathy, all of these beautiful aspects of healing. But if you do not stay with it, don't stick with it, it becomes very, very difficult. When one of my relationships broke, right, I felt all those emotions that you mentioned, right, I felt resentment that the person whom I invested so much in did not respect it enough to try and save the relationship. Okay, and I felt shame that my judgment was so bad that I made a decision like that. I felt uh, betrayal that after I had made all these huge changes, I am now in a state where I am not supported. You have to go through it, acknowledge every emotion that accompanied the, accompanies that process instead of ignoring it and saying, yeah, yeah, I was sweeping it under the carpet and saying, I don't feel it. It doesn't work. And that's what will happen, Anu, because a lot of people I know, and especially people who come in for therapy, they would have suppressed what they consider negative emotions. For me, all emotions are good. All emotions are good. There are no negative, positive, good, bad emotions. It's just that how we express them changes, uh, and they're perceived as negative. Like when I get angry, I hit somebody, then it's negative. But when I get <laughs> angry and I channelize it in the right way, it's a very beautiful emotion. When I feel guilty and I acknowledge that it's a form of love, then it becomes much easier, you know. So we'll do that at some other point, but I'd like for us to understand that every emotion is positive. And if I do not give space for that emotion to flow beautifully, I'm going to actually suppress also joy, happiness, love, and a lot of other positive states. And that's why it's so important to grieve because grief, that's why, you know, the winter, cold and all that are associated with grief because they keep you very solid and hurt and, uh, you know, sort of like a block of ice. Uh, it doesn't help you, you know, just go with the flow of life. And that's where it's very important for us to feel it. So I'll just go on to moving on because, you know, we've talked very deeply about de death as one loss. But I'd also like for us to understand that death is still something that we can acknowledge and deal with. But, you know, a broken uh, relationship, a friendship, a marriage, an intimate partner relationship, a business partnership, uh, you know, all of these are much more painful. Because you know what will happen? You'll have to see that person sometimes every day. Yeah. And then not have the reactions uh, or the triggers coming up. That's that's the more painful one. Because, and, and like I said, if it was an extramarital affair or something, it becomes even more complex. I mean, you add more elements to it, it becomes more and more complex. So that's where we'll go with what can we do. Because, you know, one of the most difficult things that people have is letting go of a relationship that didn't mm. work out. And, uh, you know, I've probably nursed a broken heart for the last one year or so because one of the most beautiful relationships in my life didn't work out the way I wanted to. And uh, I was trying to communicate back with the person, but the person just decided to build this wall and say, no, I'm not going to engage with you anymore. And that was very painful because yeah. this was something that was a very joyful part. And I remember the last year, May, June and July were like the worst. 
and I kept pushing myself and pushing myself and pushing myself. In December, I took a month off and I said, no, I need to work with this grief. Otherwise, because I was also dealing with my mother having died just a mm. few months before that. Mm. And then the most significant relationship having died, uh, you know, the person moving on and refusing to speak to me, causing so much anxiety, so much sadness. And December, I had to take a whole month off to just work on myself because my body was falling ill. You know, because it could not take the pressure of pretending that I was strong. Yeah, and yeah. this is where the first rule is don't engage with the person if the relationship is over. I made the mistake of going back, trying to speak, trying to call, trying to text, thinking that somehow there would be some kind of closure. That's really sad. Uh, and you know what also was happening was um, there were gifts that were there. There were reminders of photographs and things like that. And every time I would go back, I'm like, oh, it was so beautiful. It can still become that way. And so, you know, I didn't get rid of those things. So it's very important sometimes to get rid of these things that can be constant reminders of the person who's chosen someone else or something else over you. And it's important to do that. Yeah, you know what, when you say this, I realize I've gone through an exactly uh, identical uh, situation. But in that, like when I lost, I was about to lose Amma. And at that time, I realized the person who was very important to me at that time chose somebody else's very small thing, very small need over my necessity to get there to the airport in time to be in India before Amma passed away. Okay, and in that moment of clarity, you know, in that one second I knew my mother is dying and you don't put me first. What kind of a friend are you? You know, fatak. It, and until then I thought that was my dearest friend. It, it opened and so I still feel terribly sad that I was made to realize that at that point in life. You know, Amma's They've said there's 5% chance and I am worried I'll miss my flight and I'm stressing about it and you are stre stressing about something else, very simple like some application or something. You know, it shows your priorities and if I am not a priority at this time, then I've misjudged you as being one of my best friends. And that made me so sad because that was hope broken. I get what you're saying. You know that, like you're saying, the heartbreak is not as painful as the hope going out of life, yeah. right? I mean, and I think that's what happens when we, when, when, when people we've loved, people we've respected, move on and make choices. Mm. Um, should I move on to the next yes. part of the healing process, yes. which is let go of the story or the narrative? Okay, because what happens when we are in a relationship, especially if it's a um, you know intimate partner relationship, yeah. or, you know one of those emotions running high, hormones running high kind of thing, we usually build a narrative around the person, like you know the knight in shining armor, <laughs> this really amazing person, and all. I'm laughing because I'm thinking about the narratives I've built also, <laughs> right? Yours might be knight in shining armor. My narrative is. There is this person who will love me, devotional love it will be, and that will complete me. That used to be my narrative. <laughs> I know we are laughing because, you know, sometimes these self-deceptive patterns in relationships come and haunt us when the relationship ends. Because you know what is happening? The person has moved on, but our narrative has not moved on. Because we are still feeding fodder to that narrative that this person is actually good and all, but something that i can do can somehow salvage the relationship make it all right make it whole yeah. make it whatever and bring it back to the way it was bring it back to where it was even if you do bring it back it won't be the same because you know it's gone through that very uh, painful bitter kind of turmoil the other person and you will no longer be able to work through the relationship with the way you were able to do earlier so it's very important to let go of these self-deceptive narratives that we build around it the third is uh, acceptance is a very silent process it's not going to come out beating drum and all that and say listen i'm ready to move on kind of thing and this is where i used something and i would like to share it because like i was telling you the last year was one of the most painful i used something called conscious uncoupling 
and it's a, it's a it's a process that is beautifully outlined by a psychologist by name Catherine Woodward Thomas mm -hmm. I used her book I didn't do the course but I d used her book and I worked on myself and it has five very simple and beautiful steps simple in her words but when we work through it it's very intense so the first part in that is finding emotional freedom okay and when I say finding emotional freedom you need to realize that you'll go through a lot of these so-called negative emotions so-called guilt and all that but start realizing that they can be used as positive drivers in your life so for example you feel very very anxious so you start realizing what requires change in your life because anxiety leads you towards decisions for the future. You are trying to control the out, I mean help you ch use your emotions as a positive driver. And this emotional freedom is very important because it's no longer keeping you stuck, it's helping you expand and become a larger version of yourself. The second step which is very important is reclaiming your power and yourself. Because what happens in most of the relationships is that we start the blame game and all that and we start uh, feeling that you know somehow we are powerless we can't do this I'm broken you know these words typically when there has been a heartbreak we say I'm broken I'm shattered I'm I'm lost these are words yeah and I am I always fail at this I am never good yeah. at relationships so reclaiming your power is actually taking responsibility for what happened without blaming yourself for it uh, taking responsibility saying yeah it was beautiful at this point it's not working out this way what can I do about it you know so that's the second part of it and I'm not going to be a victim basically that's really what happens the third is where you break patterns and you heal your relationships and you know you'll notice people who had breakups and all that will have similar patterns in relationships like typically have the rejection pattern or somebody who is not acknowledging them somebody who's not respecting them somebody who takes them for granted so to start understanding these are my repeated patterns in personal life and professional life and this is how I need to work through it and it all requires a lot of time in terms of uh, like when I said time doesn't heal intention heals mm. we need to in uh, with intention look into what needs change because if I don't heal this I'll go into a rebound find another relationship that makes me feel good keeps me distracted and pulls me back into the same thing so the healing is very important for me to realize I need to move forward the next is become a love alchemist she says and that was my most beautiful uh, takeaway from the whole thing where she says you are capable of positive changes in your life of making love possible in your life for yourself and for other people and to be al the alchemist in that one is very important for the alchemist I'd, I'd like to add one more thing you remember I said my narrative used to be that you know um, I'll have this devotional love that I will get from this partner of mine who will complete me and then I realized no no I am complete right I am good it is okay and then I am also capable of tremendous love and that means I get love in return see that's the beauty of it right the moment I start when you say love alchemist when I give out so much love and it comes from a genuine place of warmth it's not like I'm doing one fake oh here I am not that I'm just saying that you know <laughs> I, I genuinely have a lot of love and affection but the once I'm able to exhibit that love and affection automatically I get tremendous love and it is the kind of love that I've always wanted and the analogy for that one in nature is where uh, you know the moon uh, can shine bright only when it acknowledges the darkness right because if the moon, moon decides to hide in the night sky it's not going to be the moon anymore and that's really what it is you know in in spite of all these relationships falling apart and becoming darkness in our life we can choose to be the love the light the alchemical part and uh, um, Catherine's uh, Woodward Thomas last point which is my favorite prepare for the happily even after you know we are so dreamy yeah. so you know we are believing in the ever after happily ever after but she says even if things fall apart and you're not able to move forward remember there will be an even after and you need to be ready for that and prepare yourself for it so the five steps that she beautifully outlines with exercises and everything are what I personally used because before that 
I had not heard of on, uh, uh, conscious uncoupling, but after I've done this, I've also worked with several clients, and we, you know, we've found beautiful results because what happens is you heal from a space of love, and you realize that it's time to let go of this person, and not because you know there is no love anymore or anything, but it's just that whatever this relationship had to bring to my life, it's already brought it, yeah. and to hold on to this is going to be poisonous now. to just let it go and to realize that the self love that i have in my life is what will take me forward to the even after this even after is something that resonates very strongly with me because i remember someone asking me what is what do you think is your biggest success in life and i said you know for me the biggest success is in a uh, success in life is the fact that despite all the failures i've seen the failures in relationships the failures in whatever uh businesses that i wanted to do whatever it may be i am still smiling i am still happy and i still believe that the world is a beautiful place and life is wonderful i think that and it's not just some platitudes i'm uttering and i see that in you anu i mean i've known you enough uh, uh to see you fail many times and rise up each time right you know sometimes you know you just have people talking about one failure and how they rose and i know of people like you yeah. who probably like been bashed this side that side it's always like you know get up and then get to the side and then yeah. this side and yeah. then, you know sort of like that but that's really how um life is yeah. and yeah. so we'll move to also the very fact that some relationships you'll just have to realize that it needs closure you know uh, i i can talk about you know sometimes um especially in therapy when we hear i mean work with some clients they've met somebody who they you know built into the soulmate narrative and i'm saying soulmate narrative because you know when you are looking for some way to validate a relationship that may not be so socially validated like an extramarital affair you believe that this is your soulmate that's come in and you know you have a past life connection and all of these let it i mean even if it is true or whatever what i'm trying to tell you is i mean those are beliefs and those are narratives that you've given to keep it alive right and then what happens is you can't get a, a decent closure out of something like that mm. i mean uh, we have to acknowledge that sometimes you may feel a beautiful emotional connect with somebody it may be the most beautiful time in your life but it still may not be for the entire lifetime and you have to give closure and this is where for other people who may be the wronged partner or whatever socially socially um you know righteousness comes in saying you know this is cheating this is all of you know these confusing narratives and don't put the person down because nobody gets into genuinely breaking marriages and things like that sometimes all of us falter mm. and that's where we need to realize that whenever it is that you get that feeling this may not work out this is not something that's going to work out well for me and the other person or the people involved give it a genuine closure and move on because it's it's a, it's extremely important to acknowledge that some of these things may seem very painful but may be necessary one of the things it reminded me of a friendship i wanted to talk about ghosting okay and ghosting is a term that our uh, this generation uses i think when someone just suddenly yeah. stops yeah. talking to you that's it you know yeah and this happened to me way back in 2006 2007 and my friend and i we were both so bewildered that this guy just one fine day stopped taking our calls we were very close all three of us were very close stopped taking our calls stopped responding to our messages just cut us out and we were so like bewildered right and we were like what just happened and would you believe it for me closure happened last year and the closure happened last year when i met him at a mutual friends party and i looked at, looked at him and i said hello doing well good that was my closure and you know you are at least lucky that that happened there are many people who struggle because mm. even that doesn't happen it's just that you know the ties have cut been cut off and then there is no closure at all and it becomes so bitter so if you do get closure great otherwise give the closure because sometimes it may not be so much about getting the closure as much as you giving the closure because it's important for that the mind to say okay now i know because physically you no longer see the person physically they no longer sharing your space but mentally to give that space saying i don't think this is going to happen and that's where i'm going to lead to the faulty patterns because you know a lot of people have faulty coping mechanisms when 
relationships fall apart the first is talking the person on social media or in real life you know so i i know you're laughing but i know i mean uh, uh, social media happened to me just 10 years back right like facebook and all came up only now but before that if you didn't see them out of sight out of mind was there like if they were not there they were not there now you can probably track them anywhere across the world i even know one girl who has the password of her ex's instagram account oh my and goodness. she keeps going and seeing where he is with i mean who he is with and everything and he has no idea that you know she's been stalking him like this and it's a really weird thing because the moment you keep doing that you're keeping those memories alive in a very funny way in a in a very dysfunctional way i won't say funny but dis- it's unhealthy right in it's a very unhealthy way because the moment you're stalking you're just giving yourself the message that i'm not over you mm-hmm. i'm not moving on i'm going to stay there you know and you may say it's for fun don't normalize it because the moment you normalize something like stalking yeah that's when it becomes dangerous and we've heard of you know very very dangerous forms of stalking as well and you know in in a country like india stalking is not taken very seriously by the legal system because no physical harm was intended and it's not as easy as that it causes a lot of emotional stress to the person who's being stalked so please understand that the second is harassment you know especially when there has been a legal separation and you know there has been a child uh, you know custody battles and all that constantly harassing the other person for uh, money for not allowing visitation those kind of things and then you know going online uh, writing in magazines about the other person and all that see it's over right it's over don't keep pulling it back and talking about that person and harassing them because that's just telling you that you're not yet healed and you're using all that anger against that person in the most dysfunctional way making it more difficult for anybody involved to move on and forgive when you start talking about something very personal in the press then you are compelled to try and paint yourself in the best light possible if you say it often enough you will end up believing it it's not doing anyone any good right just just right just right. accept what happened deal with it deal with it as facts instead of trying to restructure it into something a bit more acceptable and more palatable for other people because other people are not important you just see how more you feel more sensational not even palatable anu right now the world uses the word sensational right ah, i mean yeah. especially you know the more high profile something is the more sensational mm. and people just you know uh, absorb this information and yeah. think oh then what happened this must have happened that must have happened i mean sometimes two people just don't get along they need not be a third person involved in the equation but they'll create a third person you know those kind of things i i really feel those kind of harassment uh, things should stop the third area is uh, you know there is a recent study that says that when you let go of a person or a person leaves you you will have some kind of reaction which is like cocaine addiction in your brain meaning that you will want to go back to that person and so will create lot of very delusional stories about how this person is going to come back or you know um, i saw that you know there was a heart emoji that was put on my post or something like that so you start building a huge story around nothing like you know mm-hmm. that person who left you could have just asked how is she doing or something oh he's still interested in my well being still interested in me or he he's thinking about me or genuinely the person would have smiled across the room or something you say oh now the smile means something so this addictive nature of heartbreak is something so give yourself the story of a closure and move on if this relationship is meant to happen and i mean if in really bold letters mm. if it is meant to happen it will come all around in only another form the same person is not going to come back to you and it's not going to ever be the same so please cut it out and stop fooling yourself about it i know people who know that this guy doesn't treat you well he's not really respectful of you and he's also expressed disinterest in continuing the relationship still moping about that guy and saying that he will realize how good i am and one day he will he will discover and come back to me i think it's like living not only are you living in a fool's paradise you are cheating yourself of life exactly this is cheating exactly. yourself of life because life can be so glorious if only you would see it for what it is instead you are making it up to be something else something which it isn't and you're just cheating yourself of whatever possible joy you might have otherwise found and that's where they say you know holding on sometimes causes more pain than letting go 
because you know you're actually holding on to hot coals and it's going to keep burning your hand it's not as easy as letting go and this is where anu since you mentioned this uh, narrative i'll give you another narrative on this one so there was this girl who was in a very abusive marriage and she knew she was in therapy and she knew she had to move on her parents were fully supportive of it her mother her father everybody came in to the therapy session and said no i don't want her to go back because there's a lot of domestic violence i want her to let go but she said no 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 i'll give him one more chance one more chance and for a whole year she would go back get battered and you know it'll become a police case and everything and even the police inspector at one point said why are you going back and all that but these are very complex patterns they are complex patterns and i'm not going into why the victim never leaves but what i also want to make a point here is this deceptive narrative and this addictive aspect of it what she did finally was somebody brought an astrologer and the astrologer said it's time for you to move on and she took on took that step but that is externalizing responsibility isn't it exactly exactly and that is not moving on as much as you know you put the blame on somebody else saying i walked out only because the astrologer said it won't work out if it is your life and it is your relationships there is a, it is your responsibility to sometimes say no and that may be a difficult decision may be the most difficult thing you do in life but it may be also the most glorious thing you do for yourself and that is very very important another aspect is also checking with friends and associates about how the other person is doing is he fine is she fine all those things please if you have common friends at least set certain boundaries saying we're not going to talk about the person who's absent you know that's a very important uh, thing when you move on and the last is and most shameful of all <laughs> calling that person when you are in trouble okay relationship is not worth calling and saying listen i have nobody else and I'm... this is like guilting them into coming back is it guilting them into coming uh-huh. back self pity narrative no i have nobody and everybody is left me you're the only one and that person feels almost like obligated to come and all that so that is another very faulty form of working so we need to understand that at some point when we say don't engage with the energy it's good for your well being because you know you keep giving conflicting messages to your mind and your heart saying this has to happen and this shouldn't happen it's going to be very very difficult so at some point please realize that if you are in one of these faulty patterns it's time to let it go and time to start looking at what you can do for yourself and to move on you know this reminds me of uh, uh, something that happened when i was like very very young and there was a proposal from a guy and i i said look this is not their age to be you know looking at romantic uh, this thing so just forget it we'll just be friends leave it at that and then that guy started drinking as a method of coping with the loss and heartbreak half the times i think it is because of the kind of movies that we've been shown and the stories that we have been told that moment you have a heartbreak you start drinking and you start doing drugs or whatever but i think at the bottom it's just faulty coping mechanism isn't it yes very much because any form of addiction at some point you're replacing the void with something you know so you know this person was creating so much of joy in my life now that joy is gone there is a void and so i'm going to fill this void with a substance and you know all these substance ha- substances have effects on the brain that sort of dull us at- down and then you know we keep craving for that state where i don't need to take responsibility and i don't need to move on and yeah. that's why that's also a very very faulty coping mechanism grieving is a process and like i said it's not linear and it's individual uh, like depending on how intense it is and what your coping skills are uh, it can be 2 months it can be 2 years and i've known people who grieved even for 20 years right so um so i'm not going to give like you know in our previous episodes we've given something where they can work on it but the do's and don'ts are just so that no matter how much time it takes for you to identify what is a healthy mechanism and what would be a faulty mechanism is very important and the more you indulge in the healthy mechanisms the better it is going to be as you make sense of the grief and as you choose to move on because healing a broken heart nursing a broken heart and coming back whole in the whole process or acknowledging your wholeness at the end of it is a very individual process uh, so arti what we've done is we have elaborated on what are the do's and what are the don'ts right and i think it is always nice to have some sort of a ready reckoner because as we process uh, and as we go through our journey it will be nice to have little milestones or little signposts that tell us hey you know what this is what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing 
so shall we do the do's and don'ts yes of course i'll start off with the first do so first like i already mentioned acknowledge every emotion don't suppress or repress any emotion the second one which is a do grow through what you go through the mm. opposite of that don't stay stuck in thought traps like why me i always fail in relationships nothing good happens in my life the third do will be engage with thoughts and memories that are enriching from the relationship don't engage with thoughts or memories that pull you down the fourth do is be kind to yourself and know that you can bounce back most important don't don't be critical or judgmental of your own capacity because many times we tend to pull ourselves down by being our own dangerous critical voice seek professional help and have a support structure either as family members or friends and people who have your best intentions and interests in mind and the don't is don't think you can substitute this with addictive habits like drinking or doing dope or anything like that it just is not going to help you at all the next do is remember that it is not a linear process work with intention every time you see yourself sliding back the don't for that is don't distract yourself with social media with a lot of other habits and things like that that are going to take you away from the core issue that you need to deal with find out what works for you what works for another person need not necessarily work for you and the don't is very obvious don't ask someone else for the answers because you are the only one who knows the answers so look within find pleasures in the small things because that is the building block to finding joy in meaningful things in life don't expect a big breakthrough that one day you'll wake up and all this pain would have gone away because remember process means it takes time and of course embrace life the most important aspect embrace life and move out meet people take these experiences as they come yeah and don't shrink into a smaller version of yourself i hope today's session has made sense to you uh, anu and i thought we were going to tear up and cry a lot surprisingly it was very enriching for us to be able to speak about this pain yeah. um and i hope that as we shared from experiences without hurting or shaming anybody who made our life beautiful at one point and were the cause of pain at some other point we want you to know that life sometimes gives us challenges that we are never ready to face and i think in every heartbreak there is so much love that we can discover but never rush through this process because you know it's very easy for us to say you know we need to heal and all of that go through it very gently like you would do with a friend you need to be that best friend for yourself when you're healing through a heartbreak it is a process that is well worth every effort that you put into it and every time you slide i'd like you to know that you're not alone each of us has stumbled so many many times when we worked through grief irrespective of what the process of grief was i want you to know that if you're still not able to do it on your own it's okay to seek help especially with a therapist who's trained to work with grief sometimes medication may be required but many times a supportive friend or family along with your own intention and a lot of effort helps and professional help will help you reach the destination of finding wholeness much faster i hope today's episode resonates with you and for me it's been one of the most beautiful episodes i've done with anu because i think we put our heart out completely today we kept it real till today but today i think we put our heart out and it comes from a yeah. very genuine wish which is our favorite from the uncoupling thing right because yes. what we wish for every one of you is a happy, happy. even after even after and yeah. i think today we've been in sync with our even after yeah so i'm going to do something i've never done which is say bye <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's bye. been a wonderful journey with you
Bye. Bye.